I went back to my first slide, and I want to talk about my, my favorite Chinese character. So who can, who can read this character for me? Hmm? Oh, louder. Oh, Wei Ji, correct? OK, very good. Very clear pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you notice uh, I've incorporated this character in my company logo. And we, uh, I launch every workshop and class uh, semester with a discussion about this character. So can somebody help me define this character or uh, translate into English? What does it mean? Crisis. Crisis. Very good. So. Wei Qi means crisis. What does uh, crisis mean? Oh, wait. OK, since we're just starting out, I'll give you a, a brief heads up on my uh, rhetorical style for the workshop today. So sometimes, like during my introduction of myself, I was talking, 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 and just you saw my mouth moving and steady stream of noise emanating from me. And, but then, uh, after I did that, then I started a different style. So I, I talked briefly, and then I uh, completed a sentence. At the end of that sentence, my voice rose slightly, and I looked at you quizzically. This means my last, last thing I said was a question. <laughs> and then I'm waiting for an answer from you. So I ask the question, then you respond, and then I continue with the next talking, 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 and then another question. OK, so what's a crisis? OK, last easier question um, to, get a, to get you warmed up since it's early. So crisis is a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. OK, let's, let's, good, good. let's have a show of hands. Raise your hand if you think crisis is a good thing. OK, raise your hand if you think crisis is a bad thing. Raise your hand if you think this is a trick question. <laughs> yeah. OK, or none of the above. So from somebody who said crisis was a bad thing, why? What is it? This is harder now. Can't answer with a raised hand, right? Who, uh, who was uh, somebody that said it was bad? Now everybody tries to avoid eye contact, right? <laughs> OK, <laughs> yeah. It's bad because it can be to a bad. It's good because it can be so good. So actually, your, your answer is a little more sophisticated, right? It's, uh, no, it's good. You're saying it's, it's neither good nor bad. It depends on what happens next, correct? Yes. Yeah. So this is exactly the point that I would like to make. Crisis is neither good nor bad. Uh, it depends on what happens next, ultimately whether it will have been a good or bad thing. But a crisis is, means a uh, situation that has reached a critical turning point. Critical turning point means uh, that the situation will either get much better or much worse very quickly. So I think you know, that's not necessarily bad or good. It just is. Now, in addition to the overall meaning of this character, you notice that the character is comprised of two sub-characters, each of which has its own individual meaning. So what, if you were to interpret uh, individually, how would you define the characters? One, one means what? Danger. Danger. And the other means what? Danger. Opportunity. Danger and opportunity. And you can see how this captures the sense of crisis that we just discussed. Uh, danger and opportunity. A situation that is about to go one way or the other, uh, probably very quickly and, uh, and very decisively. OK? So, Maybe you're wondering now, why am I spending the first in five minutes of my entrepreneurship workshop talking about Chinese characters and, and deconstructing them? Uh, there is an important point here. What is it? The danger and opportunity uh, dichotomy that we talked about, does it remind you of any uh, fundamental concept in finance? So shift gears. What's the fundamental concept in finance that, that sounds a lot like danger and opportunity? Risk and Risk and return. Correct. Risk and return. That's what I want to talk about uh, at the beginning of my workshop today. And actually, this is the most important concept in the entire workshop. And actually, 
the most important concept uh, in your entire financial and economic life. So risk and return. What is the, what is the relationship between risk and return? How are those two related? Oh, okay. So she said high risk, high return. High risk, high return. This is very good. I would like everybody now to say this together with me. You ready? Okay, say. Say it together. High risk, high return. Okay, don't you feel better already? <laughs> I, I feel better already. 9.15 and we're already on high risk, high return. So what's the, what's the corollary of high risk, high return? The opposite. Don't, don't, don't say together. <laughs> this is not about our workshop. Yeah. So, okay, the opposite is low risk, low return. So, we're going to stay on a high risk, high return mindset for the rest of the day. Okay, high risk, high return, low risk, low return. This it defines the relationship between risk and return. But those two statements sound very similar. They sound like they almost mean exactly the same thing. But do they or do they mean something very different? Let's look at the second statement for a minute. Low risk, low return. What does that mean? Does it mean, okay, make it easier. Does it mean if I take low risk, I will receive low return? True or false? Raise your hand if you think true. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think false. Okay, let me qualify. What if I say, if I take low risk, I will receive no or low return? Now true, still uh, possibly false? Raise your hand. So if you think that it's false, then you should believe that there may be some low risk, high return opportunity. Correct? I mean, in order for that statement to be uh, falsified, we just need one low risk, high return opportunity. So what is it? What might be one, what is one low risk, high return opportunity? Hmm? Oh, say louder. Best. Fat? No, I mean best, like GST. <laughs> like what? Best. Taxes. Taxes, oh. So okay, it's a good point. Um, but who is able to levy taxes? <laughs> <laughs> who levies taxes? Government. Government. And what happens if individuals try to levy tax? <laughs> like, for example, organized crime. Let's say they try to levy tax on local merchants. What happens? What sanctions do they face? Prison. It's illegal, right? So it's a good point that government can maybe, uh, government can take advantage of low risk, high return opportunities because they're government. But let's limit to private sector. So let's say in private, uh, private sector, uh, private markets, what are, what is any low risk, high return opportunity? Lottery. lottery. I'm so glad that, I'm so glad that somebody mentioned lottery. I actually, I happen to have with me lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can everybody see this? No. No? <laughs> yeah, it's very small. <laughs> but I can tell you this is a, this is a Singapore sweep. First prize, 2.3 million. Uh, lottery ticket that we do today is a $2 ticket. I didn't buy this ticket because I never, ever buy lottery tickets. I'll explain why in a minute. But my friend gave me this ticket. So $2.3 million first prize. And the ticket costs only $3. So is that a low risk, high return opportunity? Low risk, high return or not? Okay, what's the risk in this ticket? Okay, $3 uh, sounds like the risk, but in fact, $3 is not the level of risk in this ticket. $3 is the amount that I risked. And actually my friend risked because he bought the ticket. So for me, amount risk was zero, which is why I'm willing to accept it as a gift, but won't buy myself. So. We risk three dollars on the ticket. Does that make it low risk? No. That means our investment was very small. We invested a small amount, but that doesn't change the risk. 
If we, if I bought one three dollar lottery ticket or a uh, thousand three dollar lottery tickets, the risk doesn't change. What's the risk? Or how, how can we meaningfully think about the risk in the lottery ticket? Hmm? Okay, I think that the way I like to think about it is we can look at something called the expected value of the lottery ticket. Expected value of the lottery ticket. So, what's the expected value of the lottery ticket? How to figure that out. Now, okay, you guys are scientists, so you're going to be comfortable with this. There are, there are seven digits in the winning number. In order for me to win the 2.3 million, I have to match all seven digits. What's my chance of winning? Just about. You can use calculator or Excel if you want. It's about one in 10 million, right? There's about, I mean, there's one less than 10 million possible combinations of these numbers. So in order for me to get one randomly drawn number and win, I have about one in 10 million chance to win. Agree or disagree? Okay, <laughs> we, we agree. What's that? One over 100 million. I think the first issue can be one in nine, so. The, I mean, the largest number I can have on this ticket is 9,999,999, right? Okay. So, so that, to me, that sounds like I got about one in 10, one, one in 9,999,999 chance to win. Okay. Now, it's a little more complicated than that because there's other prizes you know, that I can win and therefore I have more than one chance. But all the other prizes are very small. I think all the other prizes together, maybe they add up to another couple of hundred thousand dollars. So let's just start with our one in 10 million. Now, I invested, th or my friend invested $3 in this ticket. When he wins, he gets 2.3 million. So what's the payout on the ticket? It's about one, uh, it pays me about 700,000 to one, right? For every 700, for every one dollar that I bet, I win $700,000 when I win. So the payout is $700,000 to one, but the odds of winning are one in 10 million. In order for this to be a fair bet, what does the payout have to be? It needs to be 10 million to one. So this is an incredibly unfair bet, which means what? It means the expected value on this ticket is negative. This means what? This means every time I buy this ticket, I lose money. Guaranteed. I am guaranteed to lose money. So lottery is a guaranteed loss. <laughs> it is absolutely a guaranteed loss. Every ticket that I buy is a losing ticket. And how do I know this? Who sells a lottery ticket? Who sells, a, who sells this ticket? Singapore Pools, which is? run by government. So we talked before about, we talked about uh, before the low risk high return investment is what? Tax. Lottery tickets are a tax. They're guaranteed revenue stream for government. If it's guaranteed revenue stream for government, it's a guaranteed loss for players. Therefore, this is, you can't even, it's really even hard to meaningfully think of this as an investment because it's, it is an investment with a guaranteed loss. You're guaranteed to lose uh, every $3 that you spend on this ticket. So the real expected value is something like minus $2.99999999. So if you're not following this, is everybody following this? Makes sense, right? It's as if, let, let's say I offered to flip a coin with you for, for a dollar, except that when you win, I only pay you 99 cents. When I win, you pay me a dollar going to play that game? Is that low risk, high return? No. This is a guaranteed loss for you. Okay, let's, let's look at that on a bigger scale. How many people have seen the Marina Bay Sands? How many people have been living under a rock for the last six years? I mean, if you live in Singapore, you saw Marina Bay Sands, right? So, it's a, how much did it cost to build? the Marina Bay Sands the Casino Resort, what was the cost to build? Hmm? It's okay, just guess. Like a billion? It was, it was six billion dollars. Six billion dollars to build. And when it was under construction, the 
casino industry analyst predicted, projected that it would break even within five years. But in fact, how long did it take to break even is two years. Meaning the casino is earning $3 billion a year. So how are they doing that? Because they're running negative expected value games for players. They're doing exactly the same thing that government is doing in the lottery. They run games for players where players believe that they're taking low risk to generate high return, but in fact they're playing negative expected value game, so it's just a wealth transfer from players to casino. And in case you don't believe that, like, what, let's pick one game in the casino, roulette wheel. Let's pick the simplest bet in the casino, which is bet the color on the roulette wheel. So has everybody seen a roulette wheel? So they have red and black numbers, and 17 red and 17 black. So if I bet, uh, but if I bet one dollar, I win one dollar. So isn't this a fair bet? No, why not? Because there's a green number two, zero, and this is, the, this is where the casino is so smart. They put one green number in there, and then that makes the chances of hitting either red or black, what? 17 over 35. No matter what you're betting, your odds are 17 over 35, but they're paying you as if it was 17 over 34. So this means they win about 4% every time you spin the wheel. Same thing on the slot machine. Like typical slot machine pays back how much on each dollar. <coughs> pays about 96 cents. Again, 4 cents goes to the casino. But isn't that great for you? You get back 96 cents of every dollar? No. This just means that over a long enough period of time, every player in the casino loses all their money. Guaranteed. Okay, so hopefully we have dispensed with the idea of betting as, uh, or gambling as low risk, high return.